All right, let's get started. Uh, going on with the calculation I was showing you yesterday, I wanted to just point you to similarities between what Luke was showing you and what I was showing you in the last lecture. So in post-Newtonian framework, you have two objects moving around each other slowly, which means time and derivatives are much smaller than spatial derivatives because they're much smaller than the rate of change uh, location. And then you match that, you do a matched asymptotic expansion treatment with a post-Minkowski expansion far away in the wave zone. So this was uh, part of what Luke was describing. Now what I've been describing in the last couple lectures is matched asymptotic expansions between the body zone right near the small object and the external universe where you use uh, black hole perturbation theory. Treatment is very similar here because it's a small region. Time derivatives are very small compared to spatial derivatives. So in here, even though I just have one object, I'm doing a similar kind of expansion as what Luke was doing in this region. And then I'm matching it to a totally different expansion because I'm matching it to perturbations of this big black hole space-time, whereas he was matching to outgoing waves at infinity. Uh, one thing I won't get into is that at second order, in the self-forced framework, you do everything over there, and then you again match the post minkowski theory out in the wave zone. So this actually has three levels of matching rather than the two that is done here. But uh, some people have done a further layer of matching by using these, treating these as black holes, and each one where they do not quite what I do, but something similar. Okay, let me get back to the calculation I was describing. So the last thing I'd written was this algebraic equation, r to the power p minus 2, p, p plus 1, minus l, l plus 1, times these coefficients, h bar 1 pl, alpha, beta, l. Each of these coefficients is a function of time. And then that was equal to a sum over lower order modes. Where we had these operators, e superscript p, R to the P prime, H bar, one. That to be S alpha beta L, one P L, coefficients that are functions of time, times R to the P minus two. So in case uh, this equation isn't clear to you, the basic idea is on the right-hand side, we've all the coefficients up to the, the coefficient of p minus 1, part of the p minus 1. On the left-hand side, we have the p. The idea is once you know all the coefficients up to p minus 1, you get the coefficient of so this is just a recursive algorithm that can generate a solution to any order if you put it into a computer. Now, because this is algebraic, we can easily solve for the coefficients. So h bar 1 pl is given by, well, we have two options depending on whether this factor in front is 0 or not. So if that factor is not zero, we can just divide the whole equation by that factor. So we get p times p plus 1 minus l times l plus 1 inverse, because we're dividing through by the factor, times this coefficient in the source term. Of 
p times p plus 1 is not equal to l times l plus 1. Now, if this factor is 0, then this coefficient doesn't actually appear on the left-hand side, because the left-hand side is just What that means is, at this stage, these particular coefficients are arbitrary functions of t. So that's if p times p plus 1 is equal to l times l plus 1. Now, you might wonder, well, what if the left-hand side is 0, but the right-hand side is not 0? Then how do you solve the problem? I won't go into that in detail, but if the source term here for the, these particular combinations of p's and l's is not 0, Let me just put, uh, nah, let me leave it, leave it as that. It's not zero for p times p plus one equals l times l plus one. Then we need to introduce logarithm of our term. into h bar n alpha beta. So let me actually change this to n. So this actually never occurs for n equals 1. So at first order in production theory, you can prove by induction that this uh, is never non-zero for this particular combination of p's and l's. Uh, but for n greater than 1, so at second order and higher, actually do need to introduce these logarithms, and they end up allowing you to uh, solve this equation. And again, you can prove that a solution exists for all p and all l. Okay, but that doesn't for n equals 1. So let's just continue with this solution. This happens for n greater than 1. But you can see from this framework that you can do the same thing in second order. Your source gets more complicated because, say, for n equals 2, the source here, S2PL, will depend on H bar 1, P prime, L prime, alpha beta, L prime. So that's because. The source of second order contains those quadratic products of the first order field. So here we had that the coefficient of R on all the coefficients two is one. Now, a second order will also have dependence on, on the uh, lower values of n. And in general, for n greater than 1, this will depend on all the lower order modes. So for n prime um, less than n. But 
again, the conclusion is that you can still do this to any order in n, p, and l. And what that implies is that every single coefficient in this expansion, so h bar n, p, l, alpha, beta, l, function of t, every single one of these coefficients is algebraically determined by h bar n prime p prime l prime alpha beta l prime um, for n prime less than n and p prime less than p. But if you just follow this algorithm back, because coefficient is determined by the lower order coefficients, eventually you end up at these arbitrary functions of time. Because every coefficient can be written in terms of lower order ones, and eventually you'll re reach this arbitrary function. So you can actually make this statement sharper. and say that this is the specific modes n, n prime, p prime, l, p, satisfying that relationship. So satisfying p prime times p prime plus one is equal to LP prime, LP prime plus one. So the entire solution to all orders is just algebraic combinations of these special coefficients. So what are these special coefficients? For p less than zero, they appear as terms h bar n minus l minus one l alpha beta l all over r to the l plus one contracted into n hat l. So this comes from the fact that p equals minus l minus 1 is the unique solution to the equation p times p plus 1 equals l times l plus 1 for p less than zero. Now remember, way back when I first started discussing matched asymptotic expansions, we had is m over r plus mi ni over r squared plus mij n hat ij over r cubed, and so forth. And you recognize this is exactly 1 over r to the l plus 1, just as we have here. And it's n with uh, l indices, just as we have here. So these coefficients have the meaning of multipole moments, or at least you can write them in terms of multipole moments. So h bar n minus l minus 1, l alpha beta l can be written in terms 
of multiple moments of the small objects. And last lecture, I mentioned the multiple moments of the object's uh, leading order metric. But here you also get corrections to those moments. So that gives physical meaning to all these particular coefficients for p less than 0. Now what about for p greater than 0? P greater than zero or greater than or equal to zero. These coefficients appear in the metric and the form R to the L, H bar, N, L, L. Alpha, beta, L, function of T, times N hat L. So here, uh, P equals L is the unique solution for P greater than or equal to zero. Now again, recall the Newtonian example, where I wrote down the external gravitational potential as a Taylor series. So I had my external evaluated at zero, plus R phi external derivative, and I plus one half by external second derivative. And if you're doing an ordinary Taylor series, uh, you'd expect this just to be n i times n j, because that would just be, with, when you combine it with this, it would just be x i times x j. But because this is a solution to the uh, Laplace equation, this is actually STF. This is symmetric trace free, which allows me to put the STF hat on these n's. So this, again, r squared times n hat ij is exactly the form we have here, r to the l times n hat So these particular coefficients, h bar n l l, alpha beta l, are coefficients in the expansion of an external and we are put external in quotes, because this is an H. So this is part of the perturbation of the external large black holes metric. So this is actually coming from the interaction of the small black hole with the external black hole. So it's not, strictly speaking, it's part of the perturbation produced by the small object. But it appears in the neighborhood of the small object as if it was just part of the external field. So these um, identifications of these coefficients will allow me, or will motivate, 
a convenient split of the metric perturbation into two pieces. So let's define a split H alpha beta is H S alpha beta plus H R alpha beta, where H R I'll explain why it's called R in a second. HR alpha beta is the piece of our local solution that we construct with this algorithm, order by order in R. So it's the piece of the local solution that only involves these modes over there. Only involves h bar n, or I can get rid of the bar, h bar n, l, l, alpha beta, l, t, and all the linear and nonlinear combinations of these coefficients that appear in the solution. So here I'm just defining HR, and then HS is everything else. So HS is H alpha beta minus HR alpha beta. And it includes all the local dependents on those modes over there on H bar N minus L minus one, L alpha beta L. Similarities in the field equations, this will also include products of these modes and those modes, whereas I've defined HR to not contain any dependence on these particular coefficients. Okay, so what are the properties of these two different pieces of the metric? Well, one property is that HR alpha beta is smooth at R equals zero. So I'm calculating the solution in that buffer zone that's actually outside of the object. But I can, once I have the solution as a function of R, I can look at how it behaves at R equals zero. And this piece is smooth. Because it only starts at R to the L. This piece also satisfies the vacuum Einstein equation even at r equals zero. So the way to see that is remember all of these coefficients were pre-specifiable functions of time. So I can just set them to zero in my solution if I want to and I'll still have to be left with a solution. 
which means that if I just take this piece, which is left over when I set all these to zero, I must have a vacuum solution. And because it's smooth at r equals zero, it's a vacuum solution equals zero. And this is to all orders in uh, epsilon and r. What that means is we can think of an effective metric, which is the external background plus this hr, And from the perspective of the small object, if you're just sitting on the small object, this effective metric looks like an external metric. It could have been produced by anything outside of the object. And uh, in a while, I'll identify some more properties of HR that makes, th makes this um, more precise. Actually, let me mention one right now. So what I've written, but we can show that HR is causal on the world line gamma. So at a point on gamma, HR depends on the causal past, so everything within the past light cone of that point. So again, if you're sitting close enough to the small object, this effective metric really looks like it's just an external gravitational field. But a caveat to that is that if you go away from the world line, this piece of the metric by itself is not causal. So the full metric, HR plus HS, that combination has to be causal everywhere if we're looking at a physical solution to the Einstein equations. But each of them individually are not causal if you evaluate them away from gamma. So this is a, a limitation, an important limitation, on how strict this notion is that this effective metric is behaving like some external metric. You really have to go right towards the world line to make it look like a, a physical metric. OK, then HS involves all the local dependence on multiple moments of the small object and the corrections to them. So on M's multipole structure, so the small object's multipole structure. Yes? You don't impose it, it's a consequence of the way I've defined things. That's not obvious from what I've shown you, but I've just the way I've defined this thing, you can analyze its properties, and this is one of its properties. This is another one of its properties. So I'm just taking the local solution, splitting into two pieces, and analyzing the properties of each of the two pieces. 
Or are you asking, why does this make it more physical or less physical? So a physical, a physical field has to be causal. If, if it's a break in causality, it's not a physical field. It's coming from the future. <laughs> or in this case, actually traveling faster than the speed of light. So HR is not causal off the world line, and HS is not causal off the world line. On the world line, HR is causal, HS is infinite. Because it starts at 1 over r to the l plus 1, so it diverges at r equals 0. So you can't actually evaluate it on, on gamma. So this piece we can think of as the cell field of the small object. just like I had the cell field in the Newtonian case. But a caveat to this is that, as I said, HS actually depends on HR, because it depends on uh, those coefficients n, l, l, due to the nonlinearity of the equations. So it's not what a cell field would be, or not quite what a cell field would be, for an extended body in Newtonian gravity. So, for example, HS2 satisfies E alpha beta HS2. 2 equal to 2 delta squared G H 1, so this is the full H1, meaning HS1 plus HR1, and then minus the bit that HR1, or sorry, HR2 satisfies, so minus 2 delta squared G, H, R, 1. So if it was a Newtonian-type self-field, it would only depend on HS1, not HR1. So this isn't by itself a particularly meaningful field equation. So the, uh, the idea that this is the self-field is a little bit loose. Okay, so getting back to the question uh, a second ago of why does it matter whether you have these properties, um, you could choose other splits of the full metric into HS plus HR. Uh, you don't need to make any split at all. It's just that this gives a somewhat physical interpretation of things. And it will get more physical as we go. But you could make other choices if they were convenient for some other reason. I mean, all we're doing here is taking the full metric and splitting it into two pieces, and we can do that any way we like. OK, now let me just summarize what comes out of all this algorithm. You just carry this algorithm order by order in R and impose the gauge condition then what does the solution look like in the end? All this chalk is getting very worn down. All right, so some results. So the algorithm of solving those algebraic equations order by order in R, and then imposing the gauge condition. Leads to the following solution. H bar S1 TT is 4m over r 
I'm writing a approximate sign here, but this this is actually exact, this leading term. That's exactly what comes out of the solution. But then the next term, so I'll just write schematically. We have things like m a i times r plus uh, actually no, that's all for that order. Plus things like m r a i a j plus Riemann terms. And so on to higher order, and I won't write, I won't write the the T A and A B components, but I'll just state the current status that this is been worked out to order uh, R to the four, so uh, six total orders. Then at second order, TT has, well, first off, it starts at 1 over r squared. Let me put in some ends here, just to make the structure a little bit clear. No, that's less clear. N, and over here, we'll have some ends, n, i, and j. So you see, as you go to higher and higher order, you introduce higher and higher uh, multiple moments, or multiple structure. So here I'm going up to L equals 2. And in this case, in second order, we have things like m squared is the coefficient of 1 over r squared. And again, this 3 is the actual value. But then you also have uh, m times hr1 type terms plus uh, things that are just combinations of m squared or combinations of m times hr1. Then I will write one more in order field the time space component because this is where small object appears two epsilon a i j so the flat space levi civita symbol over r squared and then again you have things like m times h r 1 over r and you have the acceleration times the spin, and Riemann terms at higher order. But this is the general structure. The, the self-field depends on the multiple moments of the small object plus quadratic combinations of the object's mass with HR. So this order field is known explicitly to order r squared. Um, no, that doesn't sound right. Order r. OK, so this is the structure of HS. Then what about HR? Well, HR is known in terms of those special coefficients. H bar N L L alpha beta L is a function of T. And so it's known as in terms of linear combinations of these special coefficients and quadratic combinations of them. But uh, 
But these coefficients are not determined by the local analysis. They're just free functions. They're only determined by boundary conditions on the combination, the total metric, at large distances. So far away. So again, that goes to the interpretation of this as an external metric, because the external metric will determine will depend on the matter distribution far away from your small. Object. So HS is locally determined in terms of multipole moments, except for its nonlinear structure or nonlinear dependence on on HR. But then HR from the analysis is freely specified. You need to specify things far away in order to, to determine the actual values of those functions. This is the structure of the local metric perturbation near the small object. But then what about the equation of motion for the world line gamma? So the equation of motion for gamma is determined to be d squared z alpha d tau squared equal to minus 1 half g alpha beta plus u alpha u beta, where u alpha is the four velocity of gamma times two grad nu h r one beta mu nu. Oh, sorry, I already got the derivative over there. So it's a gradient of the first order R field. minus a different gradient do I have my indices right here uh, wait yes I did this is gradient grad beta try to make that a bit more readable of again the first order R field index mu nu contracted into two factors of the four velocity plus a term that comes from the spin of the small object. This is R alpha beta mu nu u beta s mu nu, where this two index s is just constructed from the one index spin. It's given by uh, Kronecker delta in Fermi coordinates. So it's purely spatial. Delta mu a, delta nu b times the levi chavita symbol contracted into the one index uh, spin vector. So this term, so if, uh, this is just the first order equation of motion I'm writing down. So I'm excluding order epsilon squared terms for the moment. So this term here is a term that Luke showed you yesterday in a totally different context. This is the Matheson uh, 
Papa Petru force due to the coupling of the object spin to the external curvature. Then this term here is what's usually called the first order side force or the Misa Ta Kwa force. So this is Mino, Sasaki, Tanaka, Quinn, and Wald who derived this, uh, not quite in this form, but equivalent to this form in 1996. Okay, so we're finally at the self force. But now, I'll write the second order result for the force. So the second order result is only known for an object which has zero spin. and zero quadrupole moment. So the mass quadrupole moment and the spin quadrupole moment. Then the second order equation motion for gamma is actually pretty simple looking. We got minus one half G alpha beta plus u alpha u beta, just like we had over there at first order. Then we've got a factor g beta gamma minus h r beta gamma. And then another factor, 2 grad nu h r gamma mu minus grad gamma h r mu nu, all contracted into the four velocity twice. And this is up to order epsilon cubed corrections. And here h r is the sum of the first order and second order pieces. So the epsilon times, times HR1 plus epsilon squared HR2. So you see that everything comes out in terms of HR. So this was another good reason to make that split in between uh, HS and HR. So the thing to note about all these results is that they all just come from uh, solving the Einstein equations around the small object. There's no, there's no onsets about anything, except that we assume that the metric is sufficiently well behaved to satisfy uh, that matching condition. So the only additional input is what I call the centeredness condition specifying that the world line gamma is representative of the center of mass of the small object. So I enforce that first order, the object's uh, mass dipole moment to zero in Fermi-Walker coordinates. Where the mass dipole moment in a given coordinate system tells you where the center of mass is located relative to the origin of that coordinate system. So if you set the mass dipole moment to zero, in Fermi-Walker coordinates, you're setting the center of mass on the world line. Sense that I have that uh, matching diagram between the three space times. Now we can rewrite these expressions in a more suggestive form. d squared effective acting on z alpha d 
tau squared effective is equal to 1 over 2m r alpha beta mu nu s mu nu plus order epsilon squared. So here I'm just rewriting the first order equation of motion there. And what I've done is taken these terms involving hr and packaged them into the left-hand side. So these, this derivative here is the covariant derivative that's compatible with the effective metric. G effective alpha beta, which was the external background. plus h r. So this equation is the equation of motion of a spinning test body Sorry, I doubled up on the effective here. Small object is really perceiving that, that G effective as an external metric. So if you didn't have a spin, this would just be the geodesic equation. It would just be in free fall with respect to this effective metric. And if it is spinning, well, then it's still acting like a test body in this effective metric. And you get a similar result at second order. The further helps the interpretation of this as an effectively external metric. So in second order, you have d squared effective, z alpha, dt, d tau squared effective, equal to order epsilon cubed. So this is for the special case again, where si is equal to zero, the quadruple moments are equal to zero. So again, I arrive at that just by moving all these terms to the left-hand side and comparing to the expansion of the Eudesic equation in this metric G plus HR. So the small, the small mass m is in free fall in the effective metric. This sometimes gets called a uh, generalized equivalence principle. So one interpretation or one way of stating the ordinary equivalence principle is that any sufficiently small mass, regardless of its internal structure, on a geodesic of the external spacetime. This is telling you that even if you're not treating it as a test body, you actually are taking into account its mass, then it still moves as a but not in G, instead it's in this effective external metric. So this really further interpretation of this effective metric as a kind of physical metric. 
OK, now before I started on all this matched asymptotic expansions, I was talking about the small object as a point particle. And then I kind of ditched that approximation. But now I want to return to it. So after all this structure, all this formalism getting to these results, we can ask, can we recover the point particle approximation that I was describing everything in terms of in the first couple lectures? The answer is yes, but only for the first order metric. So how do we recover that result at first order? Well, we have h bar 1 alpha beta is equal to 4m over r delta alpha t delta beta t. So I didn't write the explicit other components, the ta and ab components. But in fact, you only have tt components, that order 1 over r. And plus higher order corrections. So this includes hs and hr. This is the full h1. So now let's take this expression, which was derived outside of the small object. And let's take it to be valid for all r greater than 0. So this isn't changing the metric at large distances at all. It's only changing the metric where the small object was, and we're just replacing the physical metric there with this metric that we derived outside the body. So we're taking the external metric from outside the body and just extending it down analytically to r equals 0. Now, once we've done that, we can then show that a metric of that form satisfies a point particle Einstein equation. So let's just define the first order stress energy tensor to be whatever of the linearized Einstein tensor, in this case, the Lorentz gauge. So this is just rewriting uh, the first order Einstein equation and just defining the stress energy to be whatever comes out of this operation. Now, if you don't know anything about distribution theory, the next thing I say might not make any sense. But if you do, hopefully it does. Since this first order metric perturbation is meaning that if you take the absolute value of it in a regular coordinate system and integrate over any volume, you always get or any compact volume, so any finite volume, you always get less than infinity. So it's a well-defined integral. So to find, oh wait, sorry, I didn't finish that sentence. Since this is true, this operation, this linear operation, 
is well defined as a distribution. So that's a, a general statement that if you have an integrable function and you act on it with any linear operator that is sufficiently nice, uh, the result is a well-defined distribution. And we can, on a smooth test field, in order to find out what distribution it actually is. So here's my smooth test field, phi alpha beta. And in distribution theory, you can always uh, replace this acting on this piece with the adjoint of this acting on this piece. In this case, the adjoint is just itself. So you can, you can show that easily by just integrating by parts. So distribution theory, this is a, a definition of how a linear operator works, where this would normally be adjoint of E, adjoint of E is just E. And then if you work through this calculation, doing a Taylor expansion of E alpha beta and substituting this expression for h bar one, what comes out is that this is equal to m times phi t t evaluated at xi equals zero. But this is in Fermi-Walker coordinates, so we can replace that with phi alpha beta evaluated on the world line gamma contracted into u alpha u beta, because in Fermi-Walker coordinates, u alpha is just one in the t component and zero in all the other components. So this is how E, or E of h bar one, acts on a smooth test field. And you can see all it does is force an evaluation onto the world line, exactly what a delta function does. So this t defined to be just negative 1 over 16 pi times e of h bar 1 is the point particle delta function. And this is exact, even though I was starting with uh, just a local expansion of h bar 1. So this tells me that h bar 1 is exactly the field of a point mass. So at first order, all that matched asymptotic expansions business recovers the point mass picture. At second order and higher, uh, for the reasons I mentioned before, that is no longer true. You don't have a point particle anymore. OK, before I move on, any questions about any of this? How do I introduce it where? How did I introduce it? Yeah. 
the same way you obtain the other terms in the uh, in the equation of motion, it just comes from the Einstein equation. So I, so this S paired second order metric perturbation, and if you apply uh, the Einstein equation, this term appears in the equation of motion. Uh, this statement that's in free fall only applies when it's non-spinning. Is that clear? So that was, so in that case, yeah, it would be non-spinning, yeah. So remember that I never actually had to do much with the internal background. All I had to do was define its multipole moments in terms of its expansion at r much bigger than little m. So I just transform everything about the internal metric into multipole moments, and via the matching condition, those multipole moments appear in the external uh, perturbation series. Okay. So now I wanted to get on to how we actually do practical calculations in the space-time of the big black hole. Because everything I've said here is just local analysis. Yeah. Uh, so he's asking if there's any assumptions about the spin, such as the magnitude of the spin. Um, and no, there's not. So because of my assumptions about uh, how the inner related to the outer expansion, the way I'm doing things is restricted to compact objects. So the spin, the way it appears in the metric, necessarily has to scale as mass squared. So that this... S is mass squared, and you divide by M to get just something linear in the mass, and then that's why this is order epsilon. Um, yeah, beyond that, there's no assumptions about the spin. So the spin is order epsilon squared, but then I'm dividing by the mass. So that force term on the right-hand side is order epsilon. And what I didn't say, actually, is that the Einstein equation also tells you how it evolves by time. And what you find is that a leading order is well propagated along the world line. At higher order, it will satisfy the uh, the uh, the dipole equations that Luke wrote down yesterday. Okay. So I'm going to describe two methods of actually doing concrete calculations starting from the output of the local analysis. So the output of the local analysis was the local form of HS and the equation of motion of the small objects. So I'm not going to have time to actually go through this scheme, but I've only got a few pages left, so uh, in the afternoon I'm going to finish up and uh, finish describing the scheme. But just to get you thinking about the problem, we want to solve these coupled equations, E alpha beta acting on h-bar 1 equals 0 at all points that are not on the world line. As I said, if you do include the world line, then this first order equation, you can replace the right hand side with the point particle stress energy tensor. And then at second order, we had two delta squared G alpha beta of H1. And again, this is at points off of the world line. We want to solve these equations coupled to that equation of motion. 
d squared z alpha, d tau squared, and I'll just write that as epsilon f1 alpha plus epsilon squared f2 alpha, and currently that's the highest order we know. So these f1s and f2s were just the expressions I wrote down before in terms of hr1 and hr2. We want to solve these couple of equations. Subject to the free boundary conditions, that um, that h bar n alpha beta is h bar s n, where this is given by the output of the local analysis, h bar r n alpha beta near gamma. So if you go close enough to the world line, the metric perturbation has to take this local form that we derived from the local analysis of matched asymptotic expansions. And it's a free boundary condition because gamma depends on the solution to the problem. So it's subject to this free boundary condition. And Retarded boundary conditions at large distance. So retarded boundary conditions far away. And those retarded boundary conditions just mean that waves are outgoing at infinity rather than incoming. So no Incoming waves from infinity and no outgoing waves from the large black hole's horizon. So this just is imposing uh, causality, essentially. You don't have anything coming out of the black hole, and you don't have anything coming in from infinity. So I'm just going to uh, give these numbers so that I can refer back to them this afternoon. So this will be equation one. Uh, this here is equation two. This is equation, for some reason I've called it equation four. This boundary condition what I've called equation three. And one more thing, there's also the constraint that the divergence of the solution has to be zero up to the order that you're working at, so order epsilon cubed. All right, so I've got to rush to a meeting right now. Uh, but I will pick up with this and describe how we solve this in practice this afternoon.
Yeah, I get it. 